Um, welcome. My name is Darby Love. I'm a librarian at Nanaimo North Branch of Vancouver Island Regional Library. My colleague April Ripley is joining us from Souk. April does all the quiet, responsible back-end things to make sure everything runs really well for us. And um, I'm really excited to have our Master Gardener panel here with Dorothy Kieser as our presenter and all of you joining us. And uh, I'm here in Nanaimo on the traditional Sonomas and Stonema First Nations. Uh, you can take a moment to think about where you're located. You can put it in the chat if you'd like. It's nice to see where people are joining from. And uh, we really want to extend our heartfelt, everlasting thanks to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association for partnering with Burl on this program. And a special thanks to Joanne Canning, who is that, oh, she's... There she is in all of her clematis glory, a busy bumblebee in the clematis. And uh, she was key in creating this program along with uh, April, who didn't put that in the talk thing, and Richard Bernier, who is ensconced in Hoya plants. He is the coordinator for the second year in a row, which is a big job wrangling a whole bunch of adults. Without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Dorothy. Dorothy Kieser has been a certified master gardener for over 12 years. She brings to these library seminars her scientific approach from her career as a biologist, as well as a wealth of experience from her own extensive home orchards, veggie, flower, and rhododendron gardens. In addition to her volunteer work with the master gardeners, Dorothy is an active member of the Bevan Learning Garden, which is a large local community garden in Nanaimo featuring a greenhouse and has given numerous seminars on many gardening topics to gardening clubs and associations. Dorothy is president for the Vancouver Island chapter and is one of the club's mentors to new members. And she's also part of a steering committee that ensures high standards are kept for the basic training program at VIU. Did I miss anything, Dorothy? That was wonderful. I always feel a bit embarrassed, but uh, thank you for the oh, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit more. Dorothy is the creator of our most popular um, video in the back catalog, My Favorite Veggies and How to Grow Them. Oh, there. that's nice to know. Yes, because I truly do like growing vegetables. But in the meantime, you can look at this lovely picture of a salad, because after all, I want to talk about salad greens all year long. And, and here, of course, you see this lovely um, romaine, and then you see some mustard, and then you see some uh, probably uh, Merlot lettuce, and uh, you see a leaf of a, of a nasturtium, and of course the nasturtium flowers, which are so delicious, then the blue borage flowers. What a beautiful salad it is. And so I can only encourage you to grow lots of things that go into your salad. The only thing with the nasturtium flowers, of course, is I probably would not put the whole flower in there because, and only put the petals in. The reason being, because as you know, the uh, nasturtium flowers have that long spur at the end, and that's where the nectar sits. And guess who goes for the nectar? All kinds of things like ants and bees. And so I don't necessarily want those in my salad. So I'll get my protein elsewhere. Um, but in the meantime, you can enjoy the beautiful colors in this particular salad. I wish I'd made that salad. I did, but uh, it makes for a nice picture. So I guess I'll um, just give you a little bit more what we're going to be talking about today. Um, this is truly my favorite time of year because all of a sudden there's all these greens out there that you can pick some of the uh, wildflowers in terms of miners' letters that I'll just ever so briefly mention. But then all the things, you, if, if you're really a keen gardener, you will have started some lettuce earlier and can now start harvesting it. And it's just such a lovely time of year. And then of course we have all the flowers from the fruit trees and from the rhododendrons and on and on from the smaller flowers. So just a marvelous um, time of year. So what I'm actually going to be talking about is the variety of greens that you can grow all year long. And obviously not all the same ones, but greens that will keep you going all year long. Of course, if we were talking about salads in general, there's so many other things that one could be talking about, tomatoes and radishes and cucumbers and on and on. But I'll specifically concentrate on the greens and the leafy things. 
And even amongst that type of category, there's an endless variety that you can go for. I mean, we all know about the lettuces and the mustards and the turnip greens and the kales and on and on. So let's just get started with that. And I hope I can get the next slide to go. There you go. Um, just housekeeping wise, I uh, wanted to say as Darby's already introduced me. I'm Dorothy Kieser, a certified master gardener with the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. But I'm always very happy to either listen to or also participate in these um, seminars that the Vancouver Island Regional Library puts on. I do want to say though, that the information that I'm about to present to you is as science-based as I could make it and as accurate as I could make it. Um, but if you do use it and something goes astray, then the use of that information is truly at the sole discretion of you and you have the responsibility and liability for anything that you take out of the seminar and put to use in your own guard. And with that, let's really get into the greens. And of course, if you're thinking of salads all year round, of course you start with lettuce. And there's so many different lettuces. I mean, you could just lecture on lettuces alone simply because there are so many different ones. I mean, think about it. There's head lettuce, there's leaf lettuce, there's romaine. Um, then there's all the radicchios and endives and so on. And so if you do it right, you can really, with a little bit of help, maybe a hoop house or something like that, have greens in our very lucky climate. I mean, if some of you are coming away from elsewhere, you may not have the same growing conditions, but in the Vancouver Island or lower mainland uh, BC climate, you can really grow lettuces with just a little bit of help all year long. So um, it's actually trickier to grow lettuce during the hot season than it is to grow lettuce during the cold season because Lettuce really is a cool weather crop and you have to pick the right ones to uh, make sure you don't have them all bold as the weather gets hotter. So um, you can really have your first feeds of generous feeds of lettuce in April. So what you'd want to do is you'd want to start them indoors and then outplant them. And so what I do, I do indeed start my lettuces indoors, and then I transplant the little guys into my garden beds. And I plant them fairly densely, as you can see on this particular picture. The light green lettuce that you see along here is all Simpson Elite. And then I love the different colors, so I put Merlot as the interspersing colors. And you can see how densely these are planted. And so, um, I could, of course, be harvesting individual leaves, but at this stage uh, of growing, I just take out the intermediate heads. If I take out this head here, then this gives this head and this head a really good chance to grow a bit further. Then I take the next one out until I get about a distance of a foot to a foot and a half between plants. And in the meantime, I can eat all those thinnings. And I do the same for the Merlot and then I like adding a little bit of kale into my salad just for variety. So here we go, that's all leaf lettuce. And, uh, and I may have already said, I really like leaf lettuce because it keeps on coming. If I plant head lettuce, which I also like because it's maybe a little bit crunchier, um, but once I harvest the head, there's nothing left. So I, I but that's my personal preference. So I, I harvest them as, as I need it. And then um, you can really develop a scheme where you can have fresh lettuce all the way around. And again, I like starting them in a seed tray because that gives me more control. I find if I start them directly in the ground, then it's either feast or famine. Because I find if I seed directly into the garden bed, then I get a huge amount because I can't really control my hand that well with the seeding. And then it, it, it's kind of a waste. So if I put in individual transplants, then I have a much better control over what I'm doing. Um, but getting back to how I can have a lettuce all year long, or at least throughout the, the clement months, that is I set aside a bed about four feet by four feet. 
and I plant that with, and I start early in the spring, say about I seed the first in early March. So by mid-April, I can eat the first lettuce. And uh, and I've been doing that since about mid-April. And, um, and then every, mm, say, two weeks or so, I seed more. And as I'm emptying one patch, you really only need two or three patches of four by four. As I'm emptying one patch, I can put either more lettuce in or I can put something else in. So as summer goes on and I want some more root crops or I want something else in my garden, then I will leave that patch to grow something else, but grow my lettuce in another patch. So um, one of the things that my garden guru, Linda Gilkison always says, never leave any ground empty. Either cover it with a mulch or grow something useful in it. Because if you leave it empty, the weeds will grow, or in the winter, the rain will beat on it, and uh, and then you lose a lot of nutrients and the soil hardens. So keep growing those lettuces or any other crop to make sure that you have a nice supply of greens all the way along. Oops, let me just go back one. Yes, timing. So. In spring, timing and eating. In spring, you're, of course, right now, eating those early lettuces and any overwintering greens. And we'll get into those overwintering greens in just a little bit. And then as summer comes along, you'll have planted some heat-resistant lettuces and lots of other greens. And you will have started the fall crops and you can eat those thinnings. In fall, you get your late lettuces and endives and radicchios and many other things. And finally, in winter, you might not have that many um, lettuces anymore, but you can do endives and radicchios and many overwintering greens like the kales, for instance. And I think we're incredibly lucky to be living where we are to be able to do that. But in order to be able to do that, you really need to do a fair bit of thinking ahead of time, thinking about succession and timing and what varieties you want and, of course, the spacing that goes with it. So let me just explain that a little bit more. And uh, that top picture here, um, which comes out of a book by Linda Gilkison, and many, many of you will have heard of Linda Gilkison, probably own her books, but if you don't, I would definitely look them up because both in terms of the garden management in general, but also specifically about any bugs and diseases, Linda is just a wonderful resource. Having said that, let's just look what Linda suggests in terms of uh, succession and timing. So here's your bed of lettuce that you have planted early, early in the spring, and it's full of lettuce. And as spring goes on, of course, you're eating the lettuce and that makes space in this bed. And as there's space sort of in end of May, beginning of June, you want to be planting other things into that space. So never leaving anything, um, any piece of bed bare. So what might you plant? Just as an example, you might be planting cucumbers, for instance. And then you keep on going, you're eating that lettuce and the cucumbers grow. And by midsummer, the cucumbers are lovely. You've eaten all that lettuce that you planted first. And then you have some more space to uh, plant other things in. And at that point, you really want to start thinking about your overwintering crop or at least your late fall crops. And usually those overwintering crops and late fall crops tend to be fairly big plants. So think kale, for instance, or sprouting broccoli or something like that. So you put those smallish plants in amongst the cucumbers and then comes fall and the cucumbers will be gone and you will have hopefully had a nice feed of them. And here you have a lot of space for your rather large kale, uh, broccoli, cauliflower plants. So excellent use of your garden bed. So that's kind of one of the thinkings of succession and of timing. And of course, you yourself will have to look at the different varieties that are suitable to go into that. And especially when you're looking at lettuce and also kale and other later crops, um, looking at your catalog and seeing how long the growing time is, either from seed 
or from transplanting time, it's absolutely essential that as you're laying out your garden, you have a good sense for how quickly things um, will be edible or um, how long it'll take until you can start eating things. So that all goes into the uh, thinking and planning and preparation. Let's just look at some of the um, uh, brassica, the cabbage and uh, kale and whatnot plants. And there's so many different ones, but let's think we want to eat some of them in August and September. So you start putting them into the your seed trays in say March, April, then you outplant them into your garden in May and June. And then again, knowing how long they take to maturity, you'll be eating them in August and September or some of the other ones that need a little, uh, that you want to eat a little later, you start a little later and then eat them further into the fall. For the fall harvest, and these are again, different varieties, you start a bit later, outplant them again in about the same time and then eat them later into the fall. And then finally, the overwintering ones, which I think are especially um, worthwhile in our climate, you actually start them pretty well the same time that you start the, your um, spring planting and eating in August and September. You start them again in March, April, plant them out at the, about the same time. But then you really don't harvest until late, late in the fall. And then again, in the overwintering, you start harvesting things like uh, sprouting broccoli, for instance, start harvesting in February, March into April. And this is a lovely time of year when you can actually get those fresh greens and put them into your salad. And it's timing is so important. And again, this is uh, from Linda Gilkison in terms of growing things for winter harvest. And you can see that some of the things you actually start in February, March. So things that take a long time, like leeks and celeriac, for instance, you already start indoors, of course, in February and March. But then other things get started later. And so for some of the overwintering things like winter cabbage, for instance, that's also nice in a, as a salad, you start in early June. And for things that I'm particularly fond of, uh, like the purple sprouting broccoli or some of the winter cauliflowers, um, you start in mid to late June. And then, but a lot of the other things that are more in um, greens into the fall, like endive and radicchio, for sure you want to start them indoors uh, or not necessarily indoors, but you want to start them in seed trays in early July. And it keeps on going and, uh, and it, I won't go into everything that's on those tables, but it's really a question of getting the timing right and doing that plan planning appropriately so that you get the greens when you actually want them. It's absolutely essential that you get the overwintering stuff early enough so that it's big enough when it grows into the fall um, that a, a lot of the, try that again, a lot of the growing needs to be done during the warm weather months. And so if you get the, the seedlings in too small, then they don't have a real chance to develop before it gets too cold and they won't grow anymore. They might grow again next spring, but um, you're better off having starting early enough so that you get nice big seedlings as you're going along. So what is the very first thing we could harvest? Probably already in February. And that is the corn salad or mash, mash, mash rather. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. You start it in about October. Um, you want the soil temperature to be somewhere warmer than five and less than 18. Get, the, get, get those seeds into the ground. And then around about oh, March already, you can start harvesting those wonderful things. If you've ever traveled in France at the early spring, any salad that you get in France at that point will certainly have some of the corn salad in. It's well worthwhile for its nuttiness and it's just early fresh green. But it takes a little bit of extra cleaning and uh, it's not a very plentiful crop, but, uh, but well worthwhile if you want to have a very, very early green. 
But the next thing you, of course, want is that lettuce that I'm talking about. And the very earliest types of lettuce are some of the loose leaf. So you can see uh, on the left-hand side, they're the La La Rosa types. This is this particular one's called Darkness. Um, is ready in 30 days. And then there's others, for instance, the Selenet, that's ready in 32 days. So if you start some of that indoors, then you can really tell um, that by certainly by April, you can have a lovely amount of lettuce uh, to go into your salads. Um, the reason I keep saying um, it's good to start them indoors is that you really get that jump on the season. Because when you look at the germination guide um, that I have at the bottom of the page, you can see that, yes, the uh, lettuce seeds will start to germinate at around five degrees, but it's it's pretty poor. It's just barely make it. By the time your soil is at 10 degrees, there's a reasonable germination. But if you do it indoors, then of course, it's very easy to get up to the 15 to 20 degree range, um, get excellent germination, and then they can be outplanted into a fairly cool soil so long as it's not really freezing, and then grow very, very quickly. So well worth looking at those very early loose leaf types and, uh, and being able to jump on the season. And other early, early spring greens are very similar to that. The mustards, for instance, uh, there's many, many different mustards and I'm just showing you three different ones. The uh, giant red mustard, it really does get giant. The, the leaves at the time that you want to harvest them are at least the size of your hand um, and very beautiful. On the left-hand side, you just see them in, inside in a greenhouse but um, but then that little inset piece shows you the color of how beautiful the red mustard can look. And there's many other mustards, as I say. The Mizuna is a very uh, frizzy one, very nice and mustardy. My current favorite is the Tokyo Bekana because I like the crunch of those stems. The plants themselves get to be a good size and uh, and are very easy to grow. Um, it grows to full size in about 45 days. So if you get it started and then outplant it while it's still fairly key, it green, rather than again cool, then you can have that nice crunch of and mustardy taste in with your salads. Or in fact, a lot of these are also very nice in a stir fry or whatever you want. But here we're talking about salad so I, I want to uh, really those things in mind if you like a variety of greens in your in your salad and then of course there's many other spring greens the there's lettuce which of course is a native very nice in a salad um, two things though I wouldn't want to harvest it along a dog walk and I wouldn't want to have it in my garden unless I was really being very be careful not to let it go to seed because it can indeed be quite weedy um, and it self seeds profusely. Another lovely spring green, and I'm sure you're all familiar. Again, it's usually uh, 45 days from seed. But there's another arugula that I just discovered not too long ago, and that's perennial arugula. There's actually uh, arugula that has a very similar taste, and there's lots of different arugulas, but they all fall into the same taste category, um, that if you outplant it into your garden, you can harvest it basically all winter long. It'll slow down in growth during the cold weather months, but you can certainly harvest it all, all winter long and a nice addition to the salad. This time of the year, the sorrel also comes out nice and strong. If you've never had sorrel, it's a very sort of um, bit sour, lemony taste. So that makes a very nice addition to a salad. Um, it uh, is a perennial in contrast to the other greens that I was talking about so far. The sorrel is a perennial. So I use it this time of year when it's nice and tender and um, and then later in the summer, it gets a little bit tough, 
but because it's a perennial, I just uh, ignore it at that point. And in fact, it's a little bit like mint in the sense, not from a taste standpoint whatsoever, but um, it likes to make its getaway through its um, roots. And so I keep it in a pot so that I don't have too much sorrel in my garden that has uh, kind of gotten away from me. So in the pot, I've had the same sorrel plant in the pot probably five years without doing anything with it. I harvest in the spring and then I just water it occasionally and then I let it go. And the uh, next spring, it'll be there again. So it's it's worthwhile having just, just for that. As I was saying, um, we've already looked at the very early early lettuces, but there's a lot of mid-season lettuces. And again, you'll have to sort of look to see um, what appeals to you in terms of green. Do you like different colors? Do you like it soft, not so soft? And I'm just showing you three different types here. I've already, you've already seen the Merlot in its beauty in that very first slide I showed you. And it's very prolific. It's a, it's a leaf lettuce, as you can see, with the open head and it just grows and grows uh, well worth having uh, but there's so many different ones when you look at a catalog and I personally like um, West Coast Seed but I also like a lot of the uh, local growers that will offer you all kinds of different lettuces and they will all say how long they take and what type of lettuce it is so well worthwhile to look at the seed catalogs and pick out a bunch just so that your salads are pretty um, I showed you the Simpson Elite earlier. It goes from relatively early, uh, well into the mid-season of salads, of lettuces, salads. But then there's the head lettuces and many, many different head lettuces. One of my favorites just from the looks is something called Drunken Wim Woman because it has a fair bit of red in it, not quite as red as the Merlot, but just lovely. The speckled butterhead is wonderful. And most of those take about 50 days to mature, um, much different from those 30 day ones that I showed you for early in the season. So look at the timing that you need for, for growing it and then, and then go from there. And then of course, there's some late lettuces as well. Um, a lot of the um, romaines, Cimarron being one of them that I'm showing you there, are even slower to get to maturity. So Cimarron is about 60 to 70 days. Winter density is maybe a little bit shorter. Um, Four Seasons is a nice, crisp head lettuce, but you can also harvest the outer leaves. You can see how pretty it is. And then if you want a really sort of hefty, meaty leaf, um, not not as soft as the Four Seasons, for instance, then the jester with its little flex is an excellent one. Nice thing about most lettuces is they, they um, self-pollinating. And so you can very readily save seed. So keep a couple of uh, lettuces to make the seeds so that you can keep your favorite varieties around. Because I notice from year to year, as I'm looking at the seed catalogs, they don't always have my favorite varieties. So um, if you're particularly fond of something like Jester, for instance, or Merlot, then keep a couple of plants around and save the seeds from them. Um, as I say, the, those late lettuces, you start them more or less at the same time, maybe a little bit later than the early mid lettuces, but uh, they're just that much slower to mature. So going from that, um, to some of the other things that you want to have later in the season. And we all know that uh, around about June, July, your garden is absolutely full. So how are you going to be uh, able to have rows of endive and radicchio and whatnot later on when there's really not much space left in your garden? And again, that's why I like starting things in seed trays. As you can see here, this happens to be in my own greenhouse. I've started a tremendous amount of um, in, endive in this case, but there's also radicchio. You just can't see it on that picture in those little seed trays. And then as space opens up in my garden, either because the mid-season lettuce is gone or because there's now room under the corn and I can plant something between the corn rows or next to my tomato row or whatever it might be, 
that's then I can pop in uh, some endive here and some radicchio there. So um, you don't have to necessarily start right in the ground, but rather start in seed trays and let your things just be outplanted as time goes on. Now we come get away from the lettuce end of things and get actually into the fall, fall greens. And um, not everybody is as fond of the fall greens as you are of the lettuce. And so you, if you're particularly keen on lettuces, then you just have to work a little bit harder in finding more frost resistant varieties and starting them a bit later. But if you like the, um, the chicory um, or endive, then there's a great number of those around. Um, if you're not so keen on the slight bitterness that goes with endives, then you might go for something like the um, like the frise or benefice that has a lot of yellow heart in the center of it. So you don't have to eat the green part, but eat the center um, that is nice and tender and crunchy. Um, it's not as frost hardy, the frise is not as frost hardy. So you have to make sure that it's either protected or or just eat it before you get the really heavy duty frosts. But things like uh, endives like the Marcant or the Broadleaf Batavian can withstand a fair bit of frost. And so it's lovely to have those greens around. And with a little bit of protection, you tend to um, really be able to have those until the truly depth of winter. So lots, lots of endives. There's more varieties than I'm showing you here. And you might just want to um, experiment with some of them. And then, of course, there is something that I would not want to be without in my winter garden for my winter greens. And that is the radicchios. If nothing else, grow them for their sheer beauty. You might, you might even grow them in a flower bed. Now, isn't that a stunning color? Or the rose, the uh, rose uh, radicchio is wonderful. The Palo Rosa is what you generally tend to find in the stores, a, a very tight head about the size of a grapefruit. But so many different varieties, and there's many more again that I'm sh that I can show you here. Um, and they can withstand a really amazing amount of frost, especially in my garden. The hardiest ones that I've come across is the variegata and the rose one. Um, but the others too can withstand a fair bit of frost. And uh, I'll show you in a minute to do some frost protection. But just while I'm thinking about it is um, in this last winter, of course, you will remember if you live in uh, on Vancouver Island or in the lower mainland, you will remember we had a very warm winter and the plants thought it was getting on to spring and started to grow. And then all of a sudden we had this deep cold and it was really very uh, devastating to a lot of plants. But we were warned. I mean, the radio or the whatever, the weather forecast gave us plenty of warning. And so I went out there with my frost cloth and covered a lot of my, my greens. And a lot of it survived very well, uh, of the radicules survived very, very well under the frost cloth. But I noticed that the plants that were at the edge of the frost cloth, they were still covered, but they were at the edge of the frost cloth, did not do nearly as well as the plants that were in the center of the frost cloth. So next year, if we have a similar scenario again, I'll be sure to be more generous with my covering so that the edge is further away from my plants. And then I wanted to tell you about uh, a radicchio that is absolutely wonderful. Look at the size of it. Compare the size of that head with the person holding it. And they really do grow that big. My garden is not particularly luscious, but they do indeed grow that big. And they um, are very beautifully crunchy. They survive the frost extremely well. And one head like that will feed you many salads, really. So well worth growing that particular uh, radicchio called sugar loaf, as you can see on the slide. So there's different sugar loaves. The borka is particularly nice. Um, but as I say, there's other sugar loaves and all of them are well worth having. And then if you want a real challenge, you might want to grow Belgian endive. The Belgian endive um, 
is a fair bit of work. So that's one of the reasons why they're so expensive in the store. You uh, grow them outdoors, just you, like you would other endives. And then before the frost really hits them, you dig them up. You dig up the entire plant and uh, put, them, put it in a pot, cut off the greens, and then put that whole pot with several roots of the um, endive in, the, in it um, into some totally dark spot. Maybe you have a cellar, maybe you have another cool spot where it's totally dark. And after a while, that root starts to uh, produce another head. And that because they, there's no light, there will be no chlorophyll. So it's crunchy and tender and sweet, but it is a fair bit of trouble. Um, and it takes about 90 days from when you have cut off the initial growth and, and just put the root into your dark place for it, to, for it to form a new head. So all these wonderful things that you can grow for yourself. And in this case, you wouldn't even need much frost protection. You can just uh, dig it out before the frost comes and then have it indoors in a, in a nice um, dark place. I already talked a little bit about winter protection. And if you give um, the plants in our climate a bit of a chance, and they are a bit frost hardy, and you can read about that in your seed catalogs, then things like these hoop houses that you see here, which you can readily build for yourself with some uh, piping and then put plastic over it, or if you have a little greenhouse, that will really protect your plants from sort of regular frosts. And so it makes it much easier for you to have a nice uh, crop of winter greens. But then when we had that very cold spell, then a single layer of protection isn't going to do it. So you would then want to have more layers. And the more layers you put on, the better the frost protection. It's just like having extra blankets when it's really cold outside. And so even in the greenhouse here, you could see that the, that extra covering was done. Rule of thumb is that with each um, extra layer that you give it, you basically protect the um, plants one extra zone's worth. So think about that as you're planting your winter things, how can you best protect them from the frost? And this year with that very cold spell that I was talking about, you uh, really, I lost a lot of stuff because I simply wasn't careful enough. So a lot of my lovely endive that I had inside my greenhouse simply went to mush. There was nothing left harvestable in that whatsoever. But I did have a little bit of foresight in taking some of my more luscious looking greens, um, particularly the uh, Batavian, um, bro broadleaf Batavian and some of my bigger radicchios. And I put three or four plants into a very big pot. And I set that pot, dug the whole thing out, roots and all, and dug that, uh, put that pot into my garage. And there, even though the garage is unheated, there's enough heat coming from the house that uh, they survived that very well. So it gave them, or gave me in terms of greens, an extra, oh, three or four weeks when all this was no longer uh, attractive. So I could harvest those. If I dug out more, I would have had them even longer, but uh, at some point you run out of steam and whatnot. But here, just to show you, this was one of the variegata radicchios that uh, I had put into my garage, and you can see it's absolutely wonderful. I'm surprised how some of the kales that I didn't get around to were wrapping or covering looked okay even after ten, my, yeah, several days of minus 10. So that particular plant of red Russian is giving me lovely green uh, shoots right now. There was a new variety of kale that I hadn't tried before, and that's a perennial kale. You don't have a size comparison in this picture, but that plant stands now or to about here is about five feet. And now it's blooming profusely, but until it bloomed profusely, I could harvest all those little side shoots. But as a, as a word of warning, um, 
if we have these cold snaps or any frost for that matter, don't harvest while there's frost on the plants. The plants only have so much mm, antifreeze in them that, um, that if you harvest them or even touch them and shake them while they're still frozen, then all of a sudden the antifreeze is no longer as effective. Um, and then crystals forms form inside the cells. And, uh, and the, those crystals, of course, break up the cells. And then you end up with a mush that you saw in my poor endives. So um, if you have kales or radicchios or something like that, that have even a little bit of frost on them, leave them until you get a warmer period. And there's a very high likelihood that they'll survive that perfectly well. And after the frost is all out, then you can start harvesting again. I keep talking about um, starting things in seed trays and I just ever so briefly want you to get an impression. Um, I like having fairly deep containers like the little pots or um, little trays like this. One of the trays that I find absolutely ideal are the little mushroom containers. So when you buy a bunch of mushrooms in those little brown or black containers, that's an ideal size. So a lot of the other containers tend to be a bit shallow. So you want a, a good two, two and a half inches of soil under your seeds so that the roots can develop properly. The other thing that I really like um, in terms of starting in those trays is, of course, these are big seeds. These are not lettuce seeds, as you can see that they're pepper seeds, but the principle remains the same, is that you want to be able to have enough space between the seeds, like you see here, that's an uh, inch and a half or so, that you want to have enough space so that the plant can properly develop. And not only that, that as you're transplanting it into the garden, you can take a knife and cut along in between the plants so the roots aren't just ripped out and damaged, but that you can actually just dig out a nice amount of, of plant with soil and roots and all, and then put those into your ground, into the ground at a distance that uh, that's reasonable for that particular type of plant. And then I, in terms of the soils, um, as I'm starting my seeds in uh, indoors, I like using a commercial mix for my seed starting soil. But then for things like that I keep along um, around longer and can't outplant right away, I might actually transplant them once more into a richer soil that has some garden soil and some steer manure and some peat moss and some coarse sand for drainage. It's very important that it's coarse sand for drainage so you don't have lumps of sand. And then preferably some fish compost or other compost. And then some um, additional lime and a bit of organic fertilizer guy. Green is a good one, but there's many others and some bone meal. And then mix all that very nicely and it's an excellent transplant soil. But now moving on to non-lettuce, non-radicchio plants that also can go into the salad. And of course, there's lots of flowers that are wonderful. Even rose petals are lovely. Um, we've already talked about the um, nasturtiums, but then there's calendulas where the petals are wonderful. Early, early in the spring, the little Johnny jump ups Imagine just uh, picking a handful of these little flowers and throwing them on top of a salad. Doesn't wouldn't that look absolutely stunning? Or the petals of um, the lemon marigolds that have that, as the name suggests, very nice lemony flavor and many more. So really it's your imagination that limits what kind of uh, taste you can get in, in the way of flowers. And then of course the beautiful colors that go with it. You saw the borage flowers in our salads early on, many, many different kinds. So that's just a nice little addition to it. But in terms of getting back to the greens, then there's all the um, kales and broccoli rabs and colettes. Um, this is, for me, this is the kale season for salads. I mean, of course you can also cook with them and stir fry and whatnot, but my my personal favorite is the red Russian. And um, so here have, you have a nice plant of red Russian. 
And so the first flower shoot that comes up, but well before it opens, is, is of course the top one. So I harvest that and put it in my salad and I'm immensely proud of the nice taste, sweet and crunchy and whatnot um, that goes in with a number of other greens. And then as the top uh, plant, uh, top shoot is gone, then that allows some side shoots to form. Um, and then you harvest the side shoots and for each side shoot or top shoot that you pick off, it's almost like a hydra. For each head that you pick off, two or three more heads will develop. And uh, so one plant of kale will feed us in salads for, for weeks, literally. And then finally, there's so many heads I can't keep up and they go to flower and then I get my seeds for the next year. But there's many others, as I say, the Rob and the Colettes, and then there's um, red, red um, kale, like the red boar or, or scarlet, and then there's lacinato. When you look at the catalogs, there's so many different kinds and different people have different uh, preferences. As I say, my personal favorite is the red Russian, but I like the others as well. And of course, something like the lacinato um, is wonderful for kale chips. So if you're making kale chips, you can um, then crunch some of those up and put them on top of your salad and have an extra special taste for that. So lots and lots of greens in that cabbage family, and you might want to experiment with different ones. I showed you some mustards already in an earlier slide, but there's some mustards that you can start early, early in the spring and harvest now, or you can start them late in the fall and even overwinter them. And again, there's different colors so that your salad can be green, but, uh, but doesn't have to be just green. So here you see the red and green komatsuna. And those grow really very quickly. So from seed to harvestable is about three weeks, maybe a little longer depending on temperature, but in general, three weeks is about right. And then as a plant that I wouldn't want to be without in my garden, and that's sprouting broccoli. So as I say, you start the seed um, in a seed tray in about June. In July, you have a plant that should be about six to eight inches tall. You put that into your garden, you mulch it nicely, and then it grows. And then, then about this time of the year, you have a big plant, or you should have a big plant. Some of them get to be five foot or so tall and make these wonderful purpley um, sprouts that are great. And we are, I mean, so many people put regular broccoli into their salad and that's, that's lovely, but I think it's particularly attractive to have these, these purple sprouts. And so I grow at least one plant or two plants each year just to keep me into those little things. And of course you can cook them or stir fry them as well, but particularly in salads, they have that lovely broccoli taste and the, the, the looks. And it's uh, very much like the um, red Russian kale that I was talking about a minute ago. For each little head that you pick, at least one other, if not several others, come out as well. And, uh, and you can keep on going until finally it overcomes you and you can't keep up with it anymore. So well worthwhile. Some people actually manage to make this a bit of a perennial um, by cutting it back to, to fairly far down, maybe six inches or so above the ground and then it sprouts again. Um, I've seen it done. I've never had any luck myself, but it's uh, certainly worthwhile before you rip it all out, see if it doesn't do another season. And here's a vegetable that uh, is really quite expensive when you get it in the store, but it makes an absolutely marvelous addition to the salad, either as a crunchy bit into a potato salad, or if you make a salad um, a bit by itself, and that's the fennel. So that's the, it's called Florence fennel in co contrast to the bronze fennel, which doesn't make a bulb. But um, but if you uh, like growing fennel and you, if you like that sort of aniseed taste, then uh, then try it. It likes fairly full sun. It likes to have very fertile, well-drained soil. And the more quickly you can grow it, the more tender it is. So if it grows very slowly, it gets kind of woody. 
So you have to give it some pretty good conditions to get that ideal taste, but then it's really wonderful. And it takes about 50 to 60 days to mature. Um, and it takes a fair bit of space between the plants. I would say mm, eight to 10 inches minimum per foot spatter between plants. But uh, but then what a wonderful thing to have as sal either in a salad or its own salad. My personal favorite is to chop it really fine into fine rings and then uh, chop an orange into uh, small bits and give it some mayonnaise dressing and it's absolutely delicious as far as I'm concerned. And there's many other vegetables. There's beets, of course, you can eat the beet greens either cooked or fresh in a salad. Uh, and then of course the, the beet root itself is also lovely in the salad. Um, there's some beets that are grown specifically just for the foliage. And uh, I meant to look it up, but I forgot. Um, there's some that's called something tongue um, that's a bright red, the leaf itself doesn't show any green itself. It's just a beautiful red uh, addition to your salad. And of course, it has that nice earthy taste of beets that we all really enjoy. And then there's lots of lots of other greens that uh, you can have either as a spring vegetable or you can seed again in the fall. So um, because nowadays, now seeding the spinach, something like uh, long-standing bloomsdale, for instance, but there's other varieties. Um, and then you have a lovely um, addition to your salad, or you can seed it again in around oh, late August, early September for a fall crop. So either way, you can have a nice crop of spinach salad, and many of us enjoy that. There's another vegetable that's very similar to spinach, but it doesn't bolt as quickly, and that's aurac. There's red aurac that I'm showing you on this picture, but there's also green aurac um, that looks exactly the same, except green, of course, um, and it makes a perfectly good uh, spinach type of salad. The advantage is it doesn't bolt as quickly. You can keep picking and keep picking. The plant goes longer and you keep picking the tops off and then the side shoots develop just like I was talking about in the kale. And, um, and it goes for many weeks. What I do in, in my little greenhouse is I take the seeds of the aurac in, in the fall. Oh, it doesn't really matter, but before the frost, and I just broadcast the seed. You can also do it outside. And then next spring, around about this time of the year, I have a lawn of orac, which I cook, which I use in salads. It's just a, a wonderful addition to the garden. Turnip greens, again, make a nice salad addition. Um, and you can grow them in the fall and in the spring. And the same for pack or bok choy. You get spring varieties, you get fall varieties. You, again, you just have to look at the catalog, um, seed catalogs to see how long they actually take to mature. But um, just like that um, Tokyo Bacana mustard that I showed you earlier, the crunch of the white part is lovely. And of course you get the greens in the salad. And then if you haven't had enough, then you can grow baby greens in a in a box with just yeah, and under some grow lights or or just in a windowsill and then you shear it off and reseed and shear it off and reseed and you always have hey, of course can add herbs to it or whatever you like and that would be about my talk and just wanted to show you some books that I'm particularly fond of in terms of um, any any growing and that is the winter harvest handbook which really talks about growing lettuces and similar greens throughout the throughout the uh, cold season because Elliot Coleman has his greenhouses in the north of Maine and he produces greens without any heat for the Boston and New York market and so it's well worthwhile. If you really want to get heavy duty into growing stuff in the winter, read the Elliot Cole, Coleman book. The um, Steve Solomon book, Growing Vegetables West of the Cascade, 
of course talks about greens, but it talks gives you a tremendous amount of information about other um, vegetables as well, how to grow them, what the distance between them, what kind of soil conditions they like. And then of course the Linda Gilkison books that I've already talked about. And finally, some of the garden catalogs like West Coast Seed, but many of the other catalogs as well. And with that, uh, we can now go to the questions. And I suspect that Joe and others have taken note of that. And so we'll just go ahead and, um, and answer as many as we can. Thank you. Great. So uh, normally I like to keep my video on so that Dorothy doesn't just see blank screen, but um, we were worried about the stability of her Zoom, so we did turn our videos off just to try to keep everything better for you folks. Okay, first question. If you seed early March, is that done indoors, and when would you transplant outside on Vancouver Island? And I'm ass assuming that you're talking about lettuce. Yes, I think so. So let's, let's assume it's lettuce. Yes, you want to do it indoors. You remember that uh, germination um, graph that I showed you? Um, you want to have a germination temperature around 10 being on the cool side, but less than 20. And you wouldn't achieve that in early March on Vancouver Island. So it, indoors is great. And then the last, it's interesting. I looked up last frost dates for Nanaimo since I live in Nanaimo. So I looked up last frost dates, and it's depending on which website I went to, it was anywhere from early April to early May. And in fact, in, in my garden at about 100 meters elevation, I had frost on my roof uh, last week. So, so it's really how do you measure and where do you measure and so on. However, having said all that, you wanted to know when you can outplant it. And I would certainly happily outplant um, from the middle of April on. Great. Uh, it was also hailing as I came back from supper. For <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll just... Uh, I grew a delightful purple frise a couple of years ago, but I can't find the seed anymore. Any suggestions where to look? A purple one. I would Google it, honestly. It's amazing what comes up when you Google a particular variety of plant. And maybe uh, Joe or Richard or Susan have some thoughts on that as well. But I know in the Bevan Learning Gardens, we try many, many different vegetables and, of course, greens. Um, haven't tried purple frise, although it sounds very exciting. Um, but one of our members is a great looker upper of new vegetables on the web. And then if they sound promising, we'll try them. So that's a thought. But as I say, some of my cohorts might have some thoughts as well. Uh, Incredible Seeds uh, out of Nova Scotia um, offers the purple one. And you can uh, go to you can if you uh, uh, you can you can get to their website uh, on Google. Um, I I don't grow frise, um, though it looks incredible. But the one I want to uh, put my two cents worth in is Marvel of the Four Seasons, and um, Dorothy, you did show a slide of it. That's an incredible lettuce. What we do with them is we let a couple of them, we start them in Feb, February, the same as you. And um, we plant them out, come towards end of March. We now have rosettes. Geez, they're six, six inches to eight inches across, but they're grown in a passive greenhouse. But this marvel of the four seasons, we let some of them go to flower. And then we shake the seeds all over the garden, and especially where it's not used much, and certainly unmulched. And starting in July and August, the little seeds, they start little tiny um, plants. And as it gets colder, they get bigger and bigger, and then they will stand all winter. You can't get them as big in the winter as if you grew them out in a cold greenhouse through spring, but it's marvelous. There's some of the first things up and hence it's called Marvel of the Four Seasons. Yes, I think it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful lettuce. And a lot of our local growers
flowers. Now I can't imagine, I quite remember which one it is, but some of the ones in Machosen certainly sell that seed. That's good to know. Thank you. I have my own, but people have yeah, asked. And that's the nice thing about lettuce is that you so readily can, because they are so self-pollinating, you so readily can save seed and it'll be true to seed. Yes, and that's a good additive. I'm very much into having our own seeds. Sometimes hybrids, those of figure, are unbelievable. And I don't, we don't grow out to seed our overwintered brassicas. And um, some of the hybrids that you can get are remarkable. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with hybrids if you don't want to save seeds. Yes. Because if you do save seeds then uh, and grow them, sometimes you get something fantastic. Absolutely. But yeah. uh, but there's no guarantee that you get anything fantastic. You might get a, a dud. Yes. They're also a, very expensive now. Yes. Um, and that's a deterrent. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, Joe, was that, sorry, that was called Incredible Seeds in Nova Scotia? Yeah. Right. I, I wonder if it, there was a, a story that I have to tell. Um, there was a, a young man who was really set and determined to start a, a seed company. And he wanted, and he was in Comox, actually, and he wanted to grow his own seed and whatnot. And he could not find a piece of land that um, was suitable for his pocketbook. And so at that point, he decided he still wanted to do the seed business. So he moved to Nova Scotia and started the seed company. And I've had fantastic letters from him, but I don't know whether the Incredible Seeds is the same one or not. But it's, it's sad that land for people who are so keen on gardening and helping other gardeners, that is so difficult for them to get started. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got another question about a recommendation. Uh, Judith says, we love a good Caesar salad with romaine lettuce. My husband does not like the romaine we've grown. The leaves are too flimsy. I do not know what variety I have had as I buy starter romaine lettuce plants. Could you recommend a hearty, sturdy romaine? <laughs> Um, the winter density is, is pretty sturdy. I, I'd be nice to know what she grew to compare it with. Cimarron that I showed you on the picture is flimsy. It's pretty, but it's flimsy. But um, but the uh, but the winter density is a much firmer type of um, lettuce. And if she wants something that's really firm, she should go for the jester that I showed you. I showed you a speckled. This, yeah, it was a speckled thing called Jester. I don't know if I can go back to that particular slide. But anyway, if she can find that, then uh, that is certainly well worthwhile as a very sturdy, firm type of lettuce. Great. OK, uh, what is frost cloth, please? Is that floating row cover? <laughs> Absolutely. It has so many different names, floating rogue cover, frost cloth, remay. It's all the same thing. Um, uh, so you, you pick the name you want, but be aware that it comes in um, different thicknesses, I suppose is the right word, in terms of um, how protective it is. The thinnest, thinnest will be perfectly good to keep the carrot rust fly away. Um, but if you want real winter protection, make sure that you get something that's a lot denser than that very thin stuff. And that's where the frost cloth is. And I, I'm sure that's a trade name, but uh, where the frost cloth is one of the sort of more hefty varieties that you use for covering your winter vegetable or use several layers. You can do that as well. Any comments from Joe or Susan? Well, the frost cloth is, is, as you say, Dorothy, sometimes sold <laughs> under that name. And uh, if you look on the back of it, it has a flocking. So it would end up about as thick as two or three of the, of the regular uh, row cover. And um, I bought it one year, and yes, it was fine. But then I'm having to keep it separate from the other things. And I just ended up using more than one layer of the uh of the remake uh, yeah. and it and as you said it 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 worked just as well 
Yeah, no, I think it, it's the, it's then in the thickness. You just want a certain amount of protection and you can get that either by getting a thicker uh, piece to start with or doubling up, tripling up maybe. Or right. you can you can use old bed sheets too if you want. They yes. are temporary, sort of a cover, row cover. Absolutely. Works well. Even even newspaper will work. Oh yeah. We used um I panicked. I used Reme last winter as the weather forecast got very dire. Um I used Reme and plastic. And it worked well for the overwintering plants. But as Dorothy said in her observations of the radicchios, the ones that were on the edges of the row cover did not survive. So um, uh, you certainly, if we're going to get another spring, like we had or winter, you certainly have to protect your plants. Do you want to think and something to I learned to do in one of my colder beds um, was that I would plant my Russian kale that I absolutely That's loved you. around the yeah. outside. And That's I would keep idea. my lettuce on the yeah. inside. Right. And the Russian kale, because it could take that cold and it was taller, it created sort of a mini greenhouse effect under the reme. And I didn't lose those side plants. Yeah. And the, the lettuces, it, it worked really well. Just let one plant help another. You might nice. be careful with plastic. If you've got plastic close to the leaves, the leaves will freeze if they touch the plastic. So yeah. the cloth first and then maybe plastic on top of it. But yeah, that's the, that's the, the nice plant. thing about Rime. It doesn't do that, but you're absolutely right. The, the plastic or anything thicker uh, has that tendency to, if it's too cold, that it freeze to the leaves. And, and that's what Elliot Coleman does is, um, he has passive greenhouses for his winter stuff, which is, of course, started in August. But he leaves a permanent remake cover, and then he has double-sided plastic green, big, huge hoop houses. And if you don't touch the plant, they're like shellfish. When they're frozen, you won't damage it, and the cells won't break. But, of course, he's in his own five, and we're in his own eight. But we certainly got bits of that cold when I saw how poorly the brassicas responded. But yes, thank you enough for me. <laughs> okay, there is, um, so uh, part, there was another question about the garden cloth. Uh, where do you buy it? Anywhere? Any of the garden stores, whether it's Garden Works or whatever is close to you, will have some, definitely. Um, one time, Lee Valley had an absolutely incredible deal, so you can look in the Lee Valley catalog. That's, I don't know, any other suggestions? Those are the two that come to my mind. It's pretty yeah. common. You can pretty yeah. much get it anywhere at, at, at any full-blown garden center. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And then you learn how to use it. And if you really get into it, which we are, it's quite possible to find a garden supply company. And I'm sorry, I don't have a name. And you can buy it on the roll or yes. send a big folded up package. And when it starts to get holes in it, when either the dog bites through it or something pokes through it, you can double them up, stitch them together, double or triple, and you've got frost cloths. So it's very usable in spite of the fact it's polyester. <laughs> anyway. And then you also, had, folks had mentioned the sheets too, which is a nice reuse yeah. option depending on your size. Yes, in fact, Linda Gilkison um, goes to the thrift stores and looks for old sheer curtains. Yeah. And yeah. sews those together. I think that's a brilliant idea. I don't know how many people still use shears, so it'd be a little harder to come by. The thrift store waiting for us. It yes. is exactly so it's good all the way around. That's great. Uh okay. Um I'm gonna try. Uh oh, lots of people were really excited about frost cloth. We had another <laughs> one. <laughs> um no, if you want a winter garden, you really do have to uh, consider having a nice cover of something, frost cloth or shears or whatever. 
And the thing is, is that the light cloth, and I noticed there's a question here about using BTK for uh, cabbage moss, which we don't do. Um, we, we use the lightweight reme. When you compare the heavy reme or frost cloth to the light reme, um, you can see your hands in the lightweight insect insecticidal reme. Whereas the frost cloth is, you can barely see your hands when, when you, and so it's not woven, but the density, you can, you can see it and you can feel it. So anywhere you can buy them cheaper than Canadian tire, you know, as far as I'm concerned is good. But sorry, no more to add. I'm just typing Rime row cover just because it's kind of an odd word for yeah, Rime would be the actual uh, cloth name. And yeah, the, the brand name, yeah. The, the type of thing that it is, it's kind of like what Kleenex has become, but I don't know which companies are repackaging and under what names they sell it. Uh, okay, we've got one. I miss the names of spreading broccoli or will all broccoli do this for spring harvest? No, no, they're sprouting broccolis. And they have the little heads and they keep on coming and keep on coming while the regular broccolis and you get uh, summer, yeah. spring, summer broccolis and you get fall broccolis and so on. You have to look at your catalog to see which type is which. But they have one primary head much bigger than the sprouting broccolis. And once you cut that head off, if you're lucky, lucky, you might get a few small heads, but generally by the time you cut that one big head off, there's not much more coming. So in the sprouting broccolis, uh, the contrast to that, you cut off one head and it keeps on coming and it keeps on coming. Yeah, and there's a multitude of, of different sprouting broccolis. Um, there's red spear and there's the purple sprouting broccoli and there's other varieties as well. So you, again, you have to look at your seed catalog and see what you can get. Um, the purple has been very good in, in my experience and it's pretty because it has a different color in your otherwise green salads. But the others are, I'm sure, equally good. You just have to pick your own favorite, try different ones. And there is a, a white sprouting broccoli that um, has been popular in Europe for a long time. And I'm beginning to see it in the market now. And it um, is a little bit later than the purple sprouting broccoli. And uh, I, uh, I have not tasted it. What I've uh, spoken to uh, people that, that have grown it and uh, they say that it's um, more mild uh, and more uh, her herby, herbaceous uh, flavored. Um, but uh, the the purple sprouting broccoli, the only complaint I have it I have about it is, oh my God, will it ever stop? <laughs> yes, exactly. At some it point, just, you've just had it, then then forget it. It just makes you crazy. Just like grow one plant that that'll feed the army, you know. <laughs> but Very I. <laughs> I find though that those the little leaves up the stalks next to the uh, to the purple sprout, they they make fabulous salad greens. Oh, absolutely! The the yes, the fresh new leaves. That's right. Yeah. And and just to to go back to the the sort of fresh sprouts, um, I I like kale, but I'm not crazy about old leaves, so I would never harvest kale during the summer and early fall. I just wait until the spring when they make the new shoots and then I pick the new shoots and I think that is just the most delicious thing. And then when it begins to go to flower, those beautiful yellow peppery tasting flowers in the salads so and oh, and the hummingbirds just go crazy over them. As do the, as do the various bees. Oh yes, a, of course. There was a question on recipes. I did post, um, uh, 60 recipes using salads. Oh, so. You did, wow. <laughs> oh, yes, there it is from 735. So Dorothy, just to ask, ask a clarifying question, purple sprouting broccoli is actually the name of the variety. Is that, that's- That's correct. For yeah. When you look at West Coast seed, for instance, um, that's what it'll be listed under. Yeah, so it's not just like green sprouting broccoli and purple no. sprouting. It, 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 that's actually its name. Yeah. 
and and it's a it's a biannual. I only just learned that in class last month, that the true sprouting broccoli that overwinters is a hundred and day hundred and twenty day maturity plant, and you start it in May and June, and it stands all winter. Yes. And, that, that, and then it flowers, Dorothy, as you know, because it's springtime and, yeah. and then flowers. Yes, that's right. But yeah. you want to be sure that you started early enough, like you were just pointing out, Susan, so that it's a good size for that first year, as you said, biannual. That first year, it already needs to be a reasonable size. And then yeah. next year, we will flower like yeah. some. Probably about two feet. They got away from us the previous year, and then the dam stuff started to flower in August, stood until October, and then the frost killed it. So oh. now that our, our seasons are changing, it, it's trying to learn what height of plant. Um, but that's for us to discover. But to tell the people that are asking absolutely what you said, there are three types of spreading broccoli. And, and two of them are biannuals, and one of them is a summer. Yes, and yes. They, so you have to look at your catalogs to see whether yeah. they're, they're overwintering type or not. Yes. Hey, uh, can we just knock off all of these cabbage moth questions, of which there are three? <laughs> yes. What I used to do for cabbage moth, and uh, I, I got a new garden, and the neighbors had had cabbage moth all on. So I was absolutely infested with them. And of course it starts as the caterpillar. So first thing in the morning before work, before anything, I was out there with my espresso and picking those little green guys out of the brassicas. That slows the moth down a lot. And then I bought myself a butterfly net and I went out and I made made sure I caught four to six moths every day. And it's easier when they start mating because they're very interested in each other and you can catch them two by two. Um, and so I'm sure they died happy. But within one year, I had 25% of what I had the year before and they were quite under control. And just just doing that, you just you just go after them and be the angel of death and it works really well yeah and joe you you went out with your espresso i go out with a headlamp because oh. they, <laughs> they, you know wait until it's dark go out with a headlamp and there they are feasting away and so i can uh, get those caterpillars and do away with them you get them at night huh all get right them at night yeah yeah you but it really use, is the most it really is the most effective way yeah you can use btka on cabbage you can and i think that was the question yeah what is btk for those of us who don't know uh it's a bacteria that actually infests the gut of the caterpillar and makes it explode <gasps> that sounds gnarly too or you can go hunting okay or hunting okay. yeah those are the choices and, and I mean, the BTK is used for many things and it certainly works, but it also works on beneficials. And so I'm a little not so keen on using it unless I'm desperate for something. And you can hunt it all hours of the day, it sounds like. All hours of the day. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. They, they do the big suckers, big larvae actually um, fall off when the plant is touched. And so um, in during the day, they're not nearly as visible because they tend to be sort of on the ground or even a little bit underground. So that's why either the way Joe does it early, early, or with a headlamp, you have a better, better chance. And um, what we do, um, and last year was not a bad cabbage moth year, is that as soon as we put our spring summer brassicas in the ground, and they've been in since the beginning of April, is that they get the lightweight remake cloth immediately. And yes. because we have root maggot problems, so it kills two pests with, with one piece of remay, hoop house, and just put with rocks to keep the remay down. And that I we find is the best. The disadvantage is that you don't get to look at the beauty of the plants. You just see these white walls, you know, 
but um, that'll do it. Lightweight remake, uh, root maggot on brassicas and uh, cabbage moss. Yep. Great. Okay, I'm gonna knock through some more questions. How do you keep the transplants healthy when sown in the hot weather of July? Choose the right type. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, when I start mine, when I start mine in my little trays that I keep raving about is I can actually do that in the shade. And then I can wait until it's a bit cooler. And then, of course, you I tend to transplant in the late part of the day so that they can sort of get their bearings overnight. And then, of course, making sure that the soil is nice and moist and all this kind of stuff. Um, that really seems to help. And keeping that soil shaded as well, too, uh, don't, don't you think, Dorothy? Um, yes. So it doesn't heat up quite so much. So having it mulched or covered um, with straw or something in the yeah. bed you're going to plant. Um, what Linda Gilligan suggests is if, you're, if it is hot, but you still need to outplant stuff, then uh, you can use those seed trays that you get in nurseries or whatever, you know, that the pots come in and you can prop those up over the plant on the south side. And that gives enough light, but also enough shade to really give those little transplants a much better chance. Wow. Yeah. Uh, throwback to your gardening undercover, Joe. Yes. Okay, this is a similar question about covers. If you use cloches, at what time in spring should you worry about them getting too hot? What would be the best watering regime? Okay, first of all, um, any kind of cover uh, needs um, some sort of draft. So um, when your temperature is getting where you're taking off, and I'm, 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 putting it this way rather than talking about specific degrees. But when you can stick your fingers into the soil to your knuckles and it feels comfortable, that soil is quite warm. And when you can take your jacket off at before 10 o'clock in the morning, that's quite warm. And you need to have your cloches completely vented by then. So um, if you've got a cover over top, you need to roll it up. And um, just be aware of that, that come, come May, after we're getting generally warm, your main concern is going to be getting that through draft to keep the plants healthy. Um, and um, you, always need, you always need that kind of circulation. If yes. not, you'll do things like grow mold, uh, even if it's not hot. Or so always, plant. always circulation. And that's why some of the distances are not so much because of root interference or nutrition or anything like that, because you need to have the distance between plants to get sufficient ventilation between them so that you don't have that mold or fungus, whatever set in. So look at look at the planting tables and a lot of the catalogs or for instance, some of the books like Steve Solomon will give you a very good hint as to what the space between plants should be. And so and part. always and I always I always try to err on the the furthest space. We want to grow all this wonderful food and, and we want to have bounty and and so we overplant. And we overplant and all we're doing is starving our plants. And we wonder why our gardens don't do so well. Uh, yet if you're willing to look a little thin in the beginning you'll grow healthier plants and they taste better because they, they've been able to use enough nutrition from the soil that they're nutrient dense. So um, take it easy. <laughs> uh, similar topic, Dorothy, near the beginning when you showed the five numbered beds, uh, the yeah. person was just clarifying if they were the same bed or separate beds. Definitely the same bed. So you start with all the lettuce, and then as you're eating the lettuce, then you interplant something else, like the cucumber in the example I used. And then as the lettuce is all gone, then the cucumber has its chance, and then you put in your larger plants for the fall or overwintering. But it's the same bed. And it's from this book. Backyard. It's from that book. That's right, Backyard Bounty. I have to turn the camera around, but Backyard Bounty by Linda Gilkson, who's um, 
an entomologist, is she not? She's an yes. excellent lecturer. And um, it, it's very straightforward. Um, I don't agree with everything she says, but she's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Dorothy, would you say that salads generally require more watering than other veggies? Are there any that you've moved away from planting in the last few years of very unpredictable hot summers and water shortages? They do need they do need a fair bit of water. Do they need more than um, other veggies? I mean, even within the other veggies, the, the deeper the, the roots go, the more they can suck up from below, of course. And so earlier we were talking about the borage and how the root really goes, oh, probably two feet into the ground. So they can suck up stuff from way below while the lettuce at most needs 18 inches. So you need to keep those 18 inches reasonably moist. But a lot of other plants also fall into that relatively shallow root thing. So it's a little hard to generalize, but I don't know, maybe Susan or, uh, or Joe have some extra thoughts on that. What do you do, Susan, with uh, with your lettuces? Do you treat them that much differently than than uh, so, like some of your root crops? No, we don't. And we um, break the rules because we have two um, commercial overhead sprinklers, and that does our main vegetable bed. Um, and Watering is not an issue in Powell River. Fortunately, we have a lot of it, but we water very early in the morning and it's just set on an hour and a half to two hours and it goes probably every fourth day. Uh, so, but I mean, that's the old rule, water less frequently, but deeper so yeah. that you have that storage capacity in the soil. That's so important. So I like the idea of every fourth day. Um, we are on a well, so we can't water nearly as much, but we have a, a drip system that seems to work quite well for us. And it, of course, gets things straight to the root and uh, and then we don't get the leaves wet, which is nice as well. And, and your garden is always completely mulched whenever I've been in it, Dorothy. And that does yeah. that does make a, a, a huge difference. Yes. Um, particularly yes. with the shallow um, rooted plants like like the lettuces, don't you find? Yes, absolutely. And we don't grow summer lettuce right now. I, oh, I wish I could show you a picture. My husband has just gone mental. I harvested um, a Cimarron lettuce that was a foot and a half. Um, Wonderful. It, it's just it's just gorgeous. But in the past of greenhouses, and I know I'm perhaps not supposed to say, but every fall it's lime, seaweed, and horse manure. And then it, it they're passive. They've got that wonderful woven plastic and it's all drip irrigation and these greens are growing in the leftovers of what the tomatoes left in terms of nutrients um so uh it, what we're growing now is new zealand spinach and i want to try this red orac that um dorothy suggested the new zealand is very very uh, frost tolerant, the New Zealand spinach, but um, it didn't even survive these horrible, very cold spells um, at the end of winter. Um, nothing survived except the overwintering brassicas. So, um, but New Zealand spinach and the orac, um, and we don't eat lettuce so much. Uh, once the spinach is done, um, we, we are happy to get the broccoli and the cauliflower. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't make a recommendation. You must know more, Dorothy, what stands well. Um, yeah, and there's a new kind of spinach and I, unfortunately it escapes me the, the name just now, but it's uh, not New Zealand, but another one. And as I say, I can't come up with it right now, but it's supposed to be really quite hardy. Okay. Is that the Malabar, is that the Malabar spinach? I think that's right. That sounds right. Well, yeah. yeah, Joe, there's two of them. There's the Malabar, which is an African. Right. And, yeah. and there's the New Zealand. Ah, okay. Yeah, but the New Zealand is different also in, in looks from yes. the Malabar. It yeah. does. You're right. But there's there's two candidates for winter green, uh, summer greens. It is what I'm saying. Two, three. Um, yeah. Yeah. That aren't lettuce. 
So to the audience and to Darby and all of you, thank you. Unfortunately, seeing that it's right on eight o'clock, I promised my friends that I would not let them wait any longer. But so I'll make my getaway. Um, but I'm sure Susan and Joe and Richard may be able to stay and, uh, and thank you. And I apologize for being short on time today.